start at the beginning in terms of saying how did you end up in this whole publishing world, give us your history, but I feel like we should go straight into your recent appointment oh, okay. as publishing director of Vogue. So tell us how that happened and how that came about. Ah, oh, okay. So um, recently I was um, appointed publishing director of Vogue and um, came through lots of hard work, basically. But were um, you nominated? Did you know it was coming or was it, did it come out of the blue? Well, you know, the, nothing ever comes completely out of the blue. You can feel that, that things are changing and you need to sort of live up to certain expectations. But um, basically two years ago, I was made publisher of British GQ. And um, those two years we used as a big point of transformation. So we did a lot of work, particularly around digital. Um, it was a lot of hard work, tried to change culture a lot. As you know, a lot of media brands um, who are print in heritage have had challenges around moving into the digital space. And at GQ, there was this whole forward momentum around nailing that. So um, it was an amazing two and a half years. And uh, we had our highest revenue year of um, the decade in 2016, which is very important for a publisher. And I think that helped to pave the way for the Vogue role. I should actually explain what a publisher does, because I don't know if many people know. Like, my mother still doesn't know what I do. She is never describing what I do to other people, and I'm like, that is not my job. <laughs> um, so a publisher is, um, sits alongside the editor, and whereas the editor is responsible for all of the creativity in the magazine, the publisher is responsible for the business of the magazine and all of the media platforms. Um, and so it's about revenue, basically, so turning that creativity into cash. <laughs> Um, and that can take lots of different forms. It means managing um, the image and working with the PR teams and marketing teams to manage the image of the brand. It means advertising revenues, other revenues. Um, but it's really about harnessing creativity and turning that into revenue. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the explanation. <laughs> so prior to the Vogue appointment, obviously you was at GQ before, yeah. like you said. So you've done a lot of men's fashion. Yeah. Was that on purpose? How did that come about? Um, yeah, so I've worked in men's fashion for a while. Even when I, I worked in retail and in fashion, in personal shopping, and I always seemed to land in men's. men's yeah. And I used to think it was just a coincidence and everything. But like everything in life, there's a purpose and a reason. I think that, um, first of all, I was, not now, but I was such a tomboy okay. that I was always most kind of um, comfortable, I suppose, in men's. And when it, I transitioned into absolutely falling in love with women's wear, for me, that was like fun. And then everything else was work. Mm -hmm. And as, um, as I've sort of progressed, I realized that actually, Work is really about finding what you love. This is my top tip, honestly, and making that your career. Because we all, whatever we're doing, are working harder and harder. And um, if you are not doing something you love, it's gonna, ooh, you're gonna feel every minute, right? If you're doing something you love, then you can, you, you can push through and you'll enjoy it. Yeah. But um, I think with the menswear thing as well, I had, an incredible dapper grandfather. Okay. I mean, he was like stepping out every day. He's my grandfather on my mother's side. So um, I spent a lot of, t of my youth in the Caribbean in St. Kitts. And my grandfather had spent time in London and had a penchant for Savile Row. And, nice. and he really fused the kind of British Savile Row style mm. with his West Indian style and then also a bit with kind of the African roots. So we grew up in like a tiny village and he would step out in like a three-piece suit, like, you know, hot sun. And um, I think I just always, we were very close and I just always loved that. I always loved to see a well-turned-out man. Um, and so I guess that all of those things fed into it, yeah. Okay. okay. So let's just touch on the side of being a female publisher in a men's industry. Do you feel like the publications you have worked for have benefited from that female touch? Well, of course I'm going to say yes. <laughs> 
Um, I think that um, I just don't really think too much day to day about I'm a woman and they're men or I'm, oh, you know, whatever. I think that um, back in the day when I was coming up, there were a lot of uh, women in business, my sort of business elders and the people I looked up to and who paved the way a lot for what I'm doing and very grateful for. What I saw is that they were adopting very sort of masculine traits almost and they were kind of feeling like to make it in business I need to be tough and I need to be hard and oh, you know. And um, my view is that actually some of the things that go along with femininity um, which are stereotypical or not, you know, 100% of the case but some typically feminine traits are really great in business. So things like empathy, um, things like great listening skills, <laughs> those sorts of things really help. Yeah. And um, I think also that I don't really bring a lot of ego to what I do. So if I'm faced with like an alpha male, it's easier to kind of calmly mm -hmm. put across my points and get, get what I need done. Whereas I think two alpha males kind of yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just in general, I think that um, having a point of difference, whatever it is, whether it's a female in a male world or whatever, you know, a lot of people talked about the ethnicity side of things. Um, I just feel like being different is an absolute strength, you know, whatever that difference is. And I just would say to everybody, embrace that when you go into a situation. I know there's always lots of talk about kind of, you know, wanting to fit in, wanting to, okay, hi, <laughs> um, wanting to have people around who look like you and that's really, really important. But sometimes if they aren't around, embrace that because that's what makes you stand out. That might make people listen to you more. And also I think coming from Africa, we are not a nation of people who want to blend in, right? And I love that. When I, um, when I moved to the UK, I was seven. And I, had, I was so struck by the fact that everybody, particularly at school, wanted to fit in. And it was all about fitting in. And it was all about having the same hairstyle and the same clothes. And, the, you know, you weren't part of the gang unless you had this or that. But it really struck me as odd because I came from, I was born in Kenya and in Kenya, woo woo, <laughs> and in Kenya, right, everybody wants to stand out. Those ladies are all seamstresses, they're all making their own dresses, they're not trying to look like anyone else. And I grew up in the Caribbean and there, if you go to church on Sunday, it's a fashion show, okay? Everybody's like, that. whose hat is the biggest? You know, who's in the most color? So we come from cultures of people who are happy and confident with standing out. So why is it that in business, we can't channel that, you know, into being like, it's okay, I'm gonna be the only one here, I'm gonna stand out, and I'm gonna wear a fly dress while I'm doing it. <laughs> That's great. Okay, and also, obviously, um, in your intro, I, we spoke about your new appointment, and not just that, but prior to that in your career, you know, you've been breaking, bar you've been breaking barriers, you've been doing amazing things that perhaps, you know, wasn't expected of you. So how did you manage to deal with those challenges that came along with breaking, I don't say the glass ceiling because it's so cliche, but you know, with, with breaking. Not broken yet. <laughs> still to be broken, right? Yeah. yeah. But how, did you, how would you say you dealt with those? I guess it's that, it, uh, part of it is um, that thing about, you know, I come from a really confident background mm. and um, th all of the people before, you know, standing on shoulders of giants of people who in their own way have broken ground. Mm. I'm not gonna be intimidated by any challenge. I'm not saying it doesn't make my knees shake sometimes when there's something yeah. big, but if not me, then who, you know? We, do, we just have to embrace these things. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I was, I'm doing a lot of speaking to younger people um, and I know that there is, there's something big coming with the next generation and there's so much innovation coming and, and that generation really inspires me. 
And what I see is that there's always resistance to change. So as I'm working with those people, what I see is the people they're interacting with are nervous because they can't fully compute it, right? So I guess for me, any barriers or challenges, I look at it as it's not personal. Um, people are instinctively nervous of things that are different, but um, it's in our hands to, to help um, massage that situation and bring it around. Um, so yeah, just try not to be too daunted and try not to think about it every day. <laughs> Okay, you, you touched there briefly on, um, you know, innovation and doing things that are new and things that are different. So while you were at GQ, I know that you focused a lot on the digital side of things. You know, you're very much into tech, so you were able to expand the digital element of the brand while still maintaining the print as mm -hmm. well. And of course, breaking records while you were there. Um, so what advice would you give to any print publications that are looking, that perhaps may have challenges with the new digital age and um, how they can manage the two without? I just think that, you know, in London and in the West in general, there's this feeling that digital's competing with print and it's either digital or it's print and digital's gonna see the end of print. For me, it's like, why, you know? Um, there is no reason if you work for or run a, a heritage print brand that you can't use digital to secure your future, to future-proof you. As long as all of the, your platforms work together, so you're using your digital platform to drive your, your print eyeballs and vice versa, then it all kind of works. Um, the other thing I would say is that Africa is really leading the way when it comes to tech. So we're looking to you, you know, right, in the West, because a lot of the innovations, not just in media, but just more generally, that are coming out of the continent are being picked up in the West. Um, an example that I really love is um, in the banking space, you know, some of the necessities here are driving how we use tech in banking, uh, in, in the UK and in the West more generally. In Kenya, there's been a system called M-Pesa, which is absolutely brilliant, where you can transfer money via mobile phone because of the necessities in that country. And um, lo and behold, a few years later, Barclays Bank launched a brilliant um, scheme called Ping It, which basically used the technology um, and the concept from um, that Kenyan developer to launch this huge thing and they really owned it, you know. Um, and so I think that actually there are so many people here who are native um, technology users, so many people in tech, in STEM sciences and so on. And in the diaspora, I think we should be really proud that we're leading the charge with that. So don't look to us <laughs> in the West. You guys have the answers here and don't be afraid of it. It's not two separate things. The, um, the way that social is used um, here in Nigeria, in, um, across the continent, is so impressive. You know, people have made themselves global stars. So there's no reason that media brand can't do that if an individual can do it. So leverage it, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay, so um, are there any fashion, are there any African fashion brands that you have, that have, sorry, are there any African fashion <laughs> brands that have jumped out to you? That um, Any brands, not just here, but around the yes. continent that have popped out to you? And what are your thoughts on how they are doing there? I just fashion? think that the, again, the continent is absolutely killing it at the moment. You know, we, some of the designers coming out of Africa, Nigeria in particular, is doing incredibly well. Yes, <laughs> Kenya as well. Um, I always try to represent African designers. So even when I'm doing the International Fashion Weeks, I'll wear um, the brands who want to dress me, but I always represent um, an African brand. I'm so, everyone's so excited. They might not always say it, yeah. but everybody's looking at what we're doing um, here. Um, I was in New York uh, last week and I had lunch there with Dura Loro who is a genius yeah. um, and I think that he's just 
amazing. Um, I love to wear his clothes. And he's got this amazing world view. And he was saying to me that being from Nigeria, he feels that that gives him something different. When he's in London, when he's in New York, it gives him a different perspective to style because everybody here, everyone here is a designer. Everybody can make a dress. So if you're going to be a designer here, you have to bring something extra and different. And it was really interesting. Um, I, this weekend, will only, um, in terms of my clothes, be wearing West African designers. So I'm wearing Maki O today. Um, there's so many, but it's, it's so inspiring and I'm so happy to be here. Just, just even walking around and seeing people, how they're dressed, I'm just like, yes. <laughs> so you also touched briefly on the work that you do with youths as well. I know you're very um, interested in how arts and the youth work together. Um, what is your viewpoint on how youths, particularly within Africa, can really basically make a difference within the fashion in, mm. in industry here? Um, I think that there is an amazing entrepreneurial spirit yeah. with the generation that are coming up. This is globally, actually, but particularly in Africa. I think that one of the things that digital has done is open up and give voice to talent that was always here but yeah. couldn't ever really get, you know, in the mainstream. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a huge amount of disruption I see in music, in art, uh, and definitely in fashion, which is one of the arts, which a young, um, younger generation of bringing through with confidence, unapologetic. You know, the generation before would be in amongst um, successful people from the West and be a little bit apologetic, like, oh, I'm here too, you know. Um, and one of the things that frustrates me the most is when African uh, art is called crafts. Um, and the same thing in a different setting yeah. is art yeah, <laughs> or yeah. design. And I think with the younger generation, they're just not, they're not, just not accepting that. It's not necessarily about fighting or being difficult. They're just stepping forward like, I believe different. And so I'm going into this situation yeah. with a different headspace. So for me, it's really inspiring. And I think that we all have a responsibility to nurture that, to nurture that boldness, to not allow our children or the people that we interact with who are younger to apologize for their point of view. Yeah. Um, like the world wants it. The world wants to see their talent. It might not be obvious at first, but bring it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we will open up the floor soon. So I know you, I'm sure there are so many questions that the guys would like to ask you, but I just want to go back and just hear what your story was in terms of starting out. So, yeah, because we kind of jumped straight to the yeah. new appointment. So um, just tell us how you started out in publishing. Did you always know it was something that you wanted to do? Was, yeah. I did not even know the job of a publisher or publishing existed. So my family is super academic. Um, and when I, I always had this interest in creativity, but quite a business head. And in, in my wildest dreams, I didn't think you could fuse those two things together. So it was like one of, and of course my parents were like, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just study a profession. Yeah. My sister's now a um, doctor at Oxford University. So my parents were like, yes, what she did, <laughs> do that, you know. Um, so my path was not that smooth because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do or how to get there. I had this sort of overarching interest. So I had a lot of fun just trying different things. I, um, I worked in retail, I did personal shopping, I worked in events, um, and then when I was doing events, I absolutely loved it. I met incredible people. I was working a lot with the BBC and a lot of personalities in the UK, um, super behind the scenes, but I just stayed close to all of the people that really, you know, my spirit took to, um, not knowing you know, it's a huge bit of advice I'd give to everyone here is like, you never know where you're going to end up and who you're going to help and who might help you. So if you meet someone along the way and they might seem completely inconsequential to what your goal is, like connect with them, nurture that relationship, um, check in on them, see how they're doing because 
while I didn't know what I wanted to do, the most incredible thing and the thing I couldn't have known is a lot of those people I connected with, a lot of the time they were not successful or anything. They just, you know, I just felt something for them. They have really helped me with my career along the way. They've given me advice and said, oh, you should try this and you should meet so-and-so. And, -so. and um, so any, a, fr a friend of mine said, you'd be amazing in media. Um, I can introduce you to a friend who can explain kind of what it entails and so on. And um, that person that I saw was a director at the Evening Standard, which is a amazing magazine and um, newspaper in, in London. And he offered me an internship. And I didn't really get what it was. <laughs> I was just like, but I said, yeah, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Yeah. And um, within a couple of months, they'd offered me a permanent job. And I just had a succession of um, breaks, I would say. I was going to say luck, but I don't fully believe in luck. Um, a lot of opportunities, I think, that came my way to move up very quickly, and, and I just took them and, and um, tried to be really kind to everyone I encountered, and um, that's another thing. It comes back. Yeah. yeah. yeah so that's it. Okay. Perfect. You were also you were awarded the MBE by the Queen of England. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes, yeah. round of applause. Thank you. So the recognition, like, how does it make you feel just knowing that people are appreciative of what it is that you're doing in your industry? It's, yeah. how, it's amazing. I mean, it's such a crazy story, the MBE. It, first of all, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I didn't take it as seriously as I should have straight off because I had a situation where my assistant was away when the letter landed and... Um, the um, lady that was covering her was too nervous to open the mail. So it sat, the letter sat there for like two weeks. And my assistant came back and was like, oh, you got an MBE and you have to do this, that and the other. So we just were like, okay, let's make it happen. And then when on the day of arriving at the palace, I took my mother and my family, um, it was suddenly like, oh, whoa, this is, this is really big. And of course, my mother was claiming all of it, you know, as she should. <laughs> she was going around saying hi to everybody, like it was her party, you know, like, welcome to my house. Um, and, you know, there were just incredible people. You're in this, ho this um, holding room, which is absolutely beautiful in Buckingham Palace, and it's so surreal. And um, on that day, Rod Stewart was getting his knighthood and a bunch of other people, um, some people I knew actually, but other people I really admired. And then suddenly it felt enormous and it felt really vindicating because as you said, I always tread a slightly different path. And sometimes you have to ask yourself like, is this, you know, am I going about this the right way? So it was really nice to be recognized. Um, but my mother, going back to her, Rod Stewart came over and said hi, because she was like waving him down and everything. Just said a nice hello, it was being really charming. And my mother's like, oh Rod, sing us a song. I'm like, <laughs> turn into a 14 year old again immediately, like mom. And he turned around to her and he said, maybe later I'm so nervous. And then suddenly it was like, okay, if he's nervous, I should be nervous, <laughs> you know. So, oh, yeah, amazing. it was amazing. That's great, that's <laughs> great. Um, okay, so you officially, um, you officially start your role as publishing director in January, mm -hmm. right? So, how are you feeling? What's the first thing you're going to do when you, when you start? <laughs> you know, how, because, yeah. It's so exciting. It's like the most exciting thing that's happened in my career, and not just because it's Vogue. Yeah. Um, it's exciting because it's a whole moment. The editor, um, Edward Enningfall, is just the most incredible human. And he and I think on such a similar wavelength. We care about the same things. We come at things differently because he's a creative, I'm a business head. But um, it feels like an incredible partnership and the energy that he's bringing is just amazing. Like, it's kinetic in our office. And um, so it feels like this whole reset, you know, that's happening across the industry and it feels big and it makes me a bit nervous. But like, I think anything that's worth doing should make you feel a little bit nervous. So I'm super excited, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so if it's okay with you, we'd like to open the floor for Love questions. To. Yeah. yeah. 
Hi, Vanessa. Hi. My name is Rennie. I work in public relations and communications here in Lagos. Um, my question is twofold. One, how do you balance, um, since you're the publisher and your, your job is to make the magazine make money, how do you balance sort of creative decisions that might be a bit controversial? So for example, I just had a black woman on the cover of Vogue and all of that. So in the past, maybe a publisher might have been like, that doesn't you know, move copies. Um, do you stay totally away from creative and you just get what you, okay. So <laughs> one, how do you balance that? And then two, um, what do you think the impact of having black women in these positions that were sort of previously occupied by white men and women, what do you think that impact has on the industry? It's a great question. Um, on the front of the creativity, no, I, um, I think that the role of the business people who support, you know, um, who support creatives like Edward is to harness their creativity, not to dampen it. So um, if I'm working with an editor who wants to do something for the right reasons um, and I know it's going to be controversial, then it's my job to build the infrastructure around it to make it okay. Um, I, I, if I think there's something wrong, you know, it's controversial and it's going to um, be challenging in a way that I don't feel is, is right, then, then I will challenge that. But, um, you know, we aren't creative, we don't push the boundaries. And um, I think that having people around who have challenging opinions is difficult for business people, but, but that's where, that's my heartland. Um, I think it's been one of the reasons that um, I've managed to do quite well in the industry is that I don't shy away from those challenging characters like they're my speciality and um, I think that we need to be um, pushing the narrative um, and we need to have people around who are going to be brave always and my job is to support that and in public relations you're like front and center <laughs> you have to I wouldn't shut things down I would just think about the strategies that um, communicate the whys around something challenging rather than silence it. Um, and then with regards to having um, black women in, in, in uh, prominent positions, right, and uncovers and things, um, I think that it's super important because we, you know, there's a lot of times I hear people say things like, we can't be what we can't see. I don't entirely agree with that because no one would break through, but it certainly helps, you know. I was just um, in San, I came here from San Francisco, the jet lag is real, um, and I um, was there at a thing called Dreamforce, which is absolutely amazing. They had an entire day, it's a huge, run by a huge company called Salesforce. The thing that blew me away is how many people of color they had in leadership there who spoke eloquently and I left going into the position I'm going into at Vogue feeling ready like Michelle Obama spoke like it's undeniable that you know the whole room was hanging on her every word and everyone left feeling more empowered but particularly the black women um, and so I think it's kind of undeniable that um, it's really important my thing is that we shouldn't always make it black or white. Um, Taraji P. Henson spoke after Michelle. She spoke actually just before me, and I was like, nobody's coming to my talk. Um, she was talking about why in America in particular, as soon as someone black is involved in something, it's a black X. So if it's a program with lots of black casts, and it's a black show. If it's a magazine with black people, it's a black magazine or whatever. We have so much to learn from each other, you know? We have so much that we can take in from each other. So we shouldn't really try to, you know, be pigeonholed or pigeonhole ourselves. If you've got something worthwhile saying, whatever ethnicity you are, and, it, and diversity isn't just about ethnicity. There's a lot of different genres that need to be covered. Then the world needs to hear it, not just the people is leaning against the open door, the people who you already know will get it. What about everybody else who doesn't get it yet? They could fall in love with what you have to say as well. So, so but yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, hi Vanessa. Hi. Yeah, I love your earrings though. Thanks. 
Fair tell to Jack. Fair okay. Um, my question is, um, what has been your greatest challenge as a publisher in fashion? Then you being the first black um, publisher in the Condé Nast, I just saw now. So how does it make you feel? Thank ha you. What was the last part of the question? Okay, you being the first black uh, male publisher and the Condé Nast just passed yeah. across the screen now. So yeah. how does it make you feel? Uh, what has been your accomplishment so far? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's so strange. I just didn't think about the black thing. I just think that when I got the job at GQ, that's when everybody started to go, oh, you're the first woman to do this. I was like, am I? But then they were like, you're the youngest person. You're the first. And then I was, I was so worried about, like, I need to do this job and I need to nail it, that I didn't think about those details. And I think that, of course, it makes me super proud. Um, and I know it makes a lot of other people proud, but I just don't think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. And because otherwise it's so daunting, you know, otherwise it's like, oh, if I mess this up, then no one else is coming through. Um, and of course I'm mindful of that, but um, I think that, like I was saying before, I'm, I'm kind of used to being the only anything in a room. I mean, one of the things that was, when I was younger, I had a crazy growth spurt. So I was like normal height. And then one day I was like six foot tall. <laughs> and the school that I went to, I was one of a few black people there. And also I said when I was younger, I moved around a lot. So wherever I was, I had the wrong accent. When I moved from Kenya to the Caribbean, they were like African girl. When I moved from London, from the Caribbean, they were like Jamaican girl, because they didn't know where the island was. Um, and so for me, that all of that being a bit different just fueled this moment. That's why I said, you never know why things are happening in a certain way, but there's, there is a reason that they're happening. So um, I'm used to being the only whatever, the only tall girl. Um, and so it, I just try not to be daunted by it, but very aware of the responsibility as well. I'm trying to set a good example so that people behind me come through with confidence. Hi. Hi. Um, I mean, very, very inspiring lecture. I Thank have you. really learned a lot. My name is Anu. Um, so here's my question. I mean, you spoke extensively on publishing and stuff like that. Well, I do a bit of, um, I'm a columnist. I write, but pretty on and off. Yeah. So my question is, I'm not the publisher, right? But then I do have a bit of this high end in terms of the fact that being an economist, I still get to put out my own content. It's not edited yeah. by anybody. It's just edited by me. Yeah. So how do I keep doing it such that sometimes it's not published mm. because I don't know. I mean, you're the publisher. So that's why I need yeah. to find out from the other side of the divide. Mm. What is it that you see that you say it's not going to work? My, my column is called poise and elegance. So it's pretty much lifestyle, yeah. beauty, and you know, poise and stuff related like that. But I know that sometimes it's not published, but I don't know why it's not published. Okay. So that's my first question. What do I need to do on this side of the divide such that I ensure that it continues and there's a bit of continuity yeah. in it? That's one. Then two, with the new age of social media, definitely, I mean, they call it the new media with the new age of the social media. Um, I also want to be able to make money, even though it's not my paper. How do I then monetize, so to speak, that content on my own, yeah. using my website, using my, um, my Instagram? I'm not very good with that, but I know that it's like the new rave and all of that. But I mean, I do, I'm very good with the website bit. So how do I monetize it? So as um, from an editor, or do I say from a publisher to the editor? So I would need a bit, you know, some tips from you yeah. and stuff that I could do to ensure that I can monetize it and then I can also enjoy doing it. Yeah. And then obviously something I enjoy doing, even though I'm a lawyer, but I mean, the, the part of that seems to have a bit of, you know, I mean, I, mean, I, I do get a... 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm shy. Well, I mean, everybody says. <laughs> okay. Everybody says. I'm every gonna forget the first question. So let me. Okay. So okay. so the questions are. One, the first one. Yeah, being a columnist, okay. Being a columnist, okay. So yeah. with regards to your content, yeah. first of all, you look amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, with regards to your content and yeah. continuity, I think if things, if you're submitting, pe the, the thing I would say, if you're submitting pieces and they're not getting picked up, don't be afraid to ask why. You have a voice. Okay. I see you have a voice. Yeah. So, so ask them, you know, was there anything, without any ego or anything, was there any particular reason why this didn't work for you? Um, people might shoot you back a one-line email, but even that you can learn on and build on. All right. And look at the element, the pieces that are picked up and do well. Um, look at those and think about what they have in common. Why is it that those were picked up and, and, and did well and, and the others maybe weren't. Yeah. So learn from yourself okay. and really consume a lot of content as well because sometimes when we love doing something, we're so focused on what we do. Um, the thing is we, we, we should always, all, always be learning. So okay. try to read a lot of the stuff that inspires you and take inspiration from that. Right. And with regards to monetizing your yes. content, um, I think that you need to first build your, your, your kind of frequency and your voice. Um, and you have a powerful voice, you know, you have, right. you've got Thank a lot you. to say. <laughs> so, so do that in a really natural way and talk about the things that you love. Because people love positivity, people like positive things. Um, it's hard to monetize until you have that frequency. But also think about products that you like. Um, perhaps look at reviewing them. Um, and try to engage people as well. And then, I mean, it's not a given because nothing in life is, but it's possible that if you get that frequency and you're talking about product, then the brands behind those products might get in touch and sort of want to engage with you on, um, on some of those things. Okay, okay. thank you very thank much. You. Uh, God bless you. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. All right. Okay, my question is quite simple, but I'll explain it this way. Uh, before now, Many Nigerian designers, it still happens. Many Nigerian designers run to GQ, run to Vogue, run to which other one? Magazines to get Those styles. Are the only ones that count. Okay. <laughs> to get styles uh, out there. And uh, it's like we are copying from that way. And just like wooing a lady, just like wooing a lady who likes you but would not show it. And just like what you said, you people are looking up to us. Mm. By you people, I mean the West. How do we get noticed? What are those things you are looking for us from us to get noticed mm. and to stand out and reverse the trend from us looking up to magazines to get styles to those magazines looking up to us to get published? How do how do you do that? How we okay. get noticed? Thank you. I think that, that that goes to my point earlier a bit about social media, and um, there's a kind of endemic confidence that that. Um, brands like GQ and Vogue Love, it's not necessarily the brands that are saying, validate me, please feature me. It's like anything, you know, any kind of attraction. You're always attracted to the ones that don't need you, right? So the, the brands that are doing their own thing, making their own path, making their own connections, um, bigging themselves up, you know, super confident, those are the brands that that we typically want to work with that make us feel like, oh, okay, we want to be involved in that magic. So again, I would say that um, what we have across the continent is our own style, our own confidence, our own heritage. The brands here have magic. And the, the brands here that I sort of am a bit frustrated with are the ones that are trying too hard to emulate British or American brands because like anything, if you're emulating something else, you can never be as good as a British as being a British brand than a British brand, right? But they can never be as good as being a Nigerian brand as you've got. So harness your own magic, your own style, your own, you know, give what you've got. Like, you know, make the world want it. <laughs> uh, congratulations on all your success, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Mine's a quick question. My name is Ozzy Agu. I am a performing artist. But um, mine's more of a, 
like a teaser, if you will, because um, we're all excited for what's happening uh, in the uh, fashion business and whatnot. But uh, can you tell us a bit of the direction you're going to take uh, Condé Nast in and uh, Vogue and all that? So just a teaser so we can look forward to uh, the new reign, if you will. Okay. Thank you. New reign. <laughs> Aussie looks very GQ. <laughs> um, I mean, it's hard. I've kind of started, and Edward and I are working very closely together, but I officially start in January. So at the moment, I'm um, working on a few projects, but really the kick in in Jan. Um, I don't want to give too much away, <laughs> but a lot of what we're looking at is um, really adding an extra layer of magic to print, um, which I think Edward has down. He's doing that already. The first issue is incredible. Um, it only just hit newsstands and it's already, you know, people can't get it and it's amazing. Um, but I think my big role is to keep that going because the print entity of the magazine is so important and people love it, but really bolster the digital and social offering, um, not only for our audience from a user point of view, right, because we spend more, to all of us, we spend more time on our smartphones than we do reading anything in print, even though we love you know, to hold something tangible, but also from the point of view of the brands that we work with. So the big houses who um, I work very closely with uh, on GQ and soon to be Vogue, a lot of fashion brands, but also now tech brands, car brands, they really care about having a voice in the digital space. Um, and Vogue, will be the brand that helps them do that um, in an effective way. So, and lots more to come, but yeah. Hi, Hi Vanessa. Hi. <laughs> um, my name is Pekka, and I run an organization called The Assembly, and I'm aware of all called the what, great- sorry? The Assembly. Okay. And I'm aware of all the great work that you do with youth and UAL. Um, what kind of advice would you give me? Because we work a lot with uh, young people who are trying to enter the fashion industry. We engage them, empower them on a monthly basis through mentoring, workshops. And I guess I'm at that stage where I'm trying to kind of create some structure to be able to help them more and give them the kind of need that they help um, need. So what kind of advice would you give me? Yeah. Thank this you. is such a great thing to do. Like, I'm super Thank passionate you. about it. Um, and you seem really young yourself, so really incredible. Uh, I have a big cheeks, but I'm not. <laughs> I have two children. Good cheeks. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, um, I think the structure thing is really, really important. So um, whenever you have an engagement with uh, the people that you're mentoring or work with, at that point, it's really important for them to know what the next engagement is, not kind of keeping it to... Uh, sporadic um, I think tangible you know sometimes I remember when I was younger going to all you know like I was saying I didn't quite know what I wanted to do so I went to lots of talks I went to the things that I knew were available to me and some of the advice felt so lofty you know and kind of like abstract that it, it was really hard to know like I was like I agree but what does that mean day to day what do I do day to day so I think try to break down the advice that you give day to day. And I think the other thing about youth development is um, a lot of times we focus on people's talents, but sometimes you can be the most talented person in the room and never arrive, you know, never hit success. So for me, the most important thing is how do you translate your talent into success and that's a lot to do a lot of times people I work with need coaching on their confidence um, sometimes false confidence because sometimes when people are insecure they act like they're arrogant but actually you know so it's about preparing people to be in the situations they're going to be in and really connect their talent to uh, success in a practical way but amazing I love that you're doing that <laughs> Hi Vanessa. Hi. My name is JC and I am a fashion designer. Basically I do t-shirts. So oh, but here's the thing, everything I learned, including how to cut, I learned online. 
right? Amazing. I learned from I learned from some magazines and all. But here's the problem I have. Some sometimes Nigerians or some Nigerian designers tend to want to go and use Nigerian fabrics, right, to do foreign stuff. Now that is cool, but where is the where is the uniqueness? Where is the or originality? Yeah. So the question I want to ask is, how do you break that barrier, most especially in men's fashion? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It's um, a really good question. I mean, it's the age of the T-shirt as well. Everybody loves the T-shirt, the slogan tees, and all of those sorts of things. I think that um, there's a big job to be done on that, right? Like the, sometimes the things that are uh, that feel homegrown don't feel as exotic, so less worthy, but they are. Um, I think that um, what I would suggest is that if you see people around you, you can see in, in the media in general who kind of feels like they're into similar things to what you do, reach out to them. Um, if you're able to um, see if they will endorse your product or wear your product, and it's incredible what happens, how you can change minds if you get a few of the right people on board. So the right person wearing your t-shirts will have those people who are in any way doubtful on board. So I think that's the way that I would go with that. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. Uh, my name is Brown. My question is this. Um, earlier on when you spoke, you talked about the challenges you faced you know, going into the fashion world, coming from a family that was full of academicians. Now, I really want you to give me pointers. How were you able to overcome those challenges or that particular challenge? Yeah. Um, I think so many people come from family, especially in Africa, you know, and it's the same across the developing world. Our parents just want the best for us, so they want us to go for the most secure careers. So they want you to be a doctor or a lawyer, or, um, which are all very noble professions. If your family um, can't be your mentors in the things that you want to do, and it's very likely that if you're doing something different, they can't, they don't understand it themselves, then find your own mentors. Um, I, like I was saying about nurturing the relationships, if, if you come across someone who is inspiring to you and you can build a relationship with them, then do that, you know, even if it feels like a reach. Um, I mean, make sure there's an actual relationship first, but um, I, the thing that I did unwittingly, actually, I make it sound like it was a master plan, but is I just built my own mentors. And there's a dear friend of mine who runs a media company um, in London um, who unbeknownst to her was my mentor we were just going to lunch from what she thought but I would have a list of questions in my bag that in the taxi there I would be going through and when I arrived you know I would chat and I'd ask her what's going on and how's her son and da 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 and then I would like oh by the way how would you deal with this and how would you deal with that and I had nurtured that friendship enough that she was open to giving me that time to help me. So I think the, it's, it's challenging to break new ground that's different to your family and the people around you, but you can make your own family of supporters, like create your squad of mentors. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Congratulations. Thank Vanessa. you. My name is Jumoke Kasim. I'm a sustainability consultant. Uh, Your what? Sorry? Sustainability consultant. Oh, great. Amazing. I promote adaptation to climate change. Yes. So my question is how will you be promoting that in business operation for stakeholders? Because as a publisher, you have uh, yeah. a lot of influence to be able to do that uh, for businesses in the sector and for your operation. Yeah. Uh, most especially getting uh, old publication maybe recycled yes. and then using the best adaptation products. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, again, I think when it comes to sustainability, um, Africa is one of the countries that's at the forefront. I had a great meeting with um, with Vivian Westwood, who was talking about how naturally everybody recycles here, because why would you waste things? So people are making products from old products just naturally. And in the West, 
um, outside of Scandinavia, I would say, that's not something that comes naturally. We're, you know, it's like a really big deal to recycle, whereas I think this happens here. And then sustainability in production chains is really important going forward. And of course, for a legacy print um, brand, paper, we have to be really careful about how we use that. Um, already we're looking at things like not overprinting because um, when I started in the industry there was this kind of move to just print as many as possible and then pulp what you don't use and now it's like well that's not financially viable number one and number two it's so wasteful so we're being much tighter at looking at our numbers how things sell where they sell and producing to the right amounts I think also digital really helps because um, of course, it's much more sustainable, um, those platforms. And I think also really rewarding the brands um, in the fashion space, um, actually beyond the fashion space, um, I think in car brands and so on are really looking at sustainability, really rewarding those brands with um, space really for, for that and championing that. So amazing area to work in. Cool. <laughs> Um, I've had um, a lot of um, section today, and you actually caught me on our way. Uh, thank you very much for coming down. Thank I, you. The publishing part of um, the whole of, um, of fashion business, I would like you to um, put in some lights for me. What actually happened is this. I'm a journalist. Uh, while I was on, on campus, you know, in college, I, I report for, I freelance. I'm a freelance writer for yeah. most of the national delays, except for maybe one or two. But unfortunately, there seems to have been um, a kind of, um, I don't know if I should call it Kaba in this our own, in Nigeria, when it comes to um, you know, uh, media, anything that has to do with, that has to do with print, media, or uh, all the other aspect of it. So what actually happened is this, I had a, a platform with my advanced chancellor, then I Table the question to him. I tabled the question to him, and unfortunately, the audience I got from the deans and the likes was not productive. Okay. So I would like you to I would like to ask you, what can I do? How can I actually um, fend for myself when it comes to um, um, writing, then publishing eventually, other than having to table my I mean limiting myself to one media outfit or whatever. This yeah. is actually a, a, a major issue, and I don't know what else I should do about yeah. it. So that is why I'm asking you right now, what can I actually do about so it? So you want to work with more media outlets, and you feel like there's a bar mm. with your journalism? At no, the not necessarily a bigger outlet. Fine, if I, I mean, it's going to be an added advantage. But what I'm saying in essence is this. I am, the, most of the national delays we have here in Nigeria, the media outfits, they tend to have a, a personal, things they want from yeah. their, so I want to create something for myself without having to subject myself to those, yeah. uh, those... Yeah, uh, those particular media yes. outlets. Okay. So what I can I do you. about it? Thank I you very much. I think that, well, firstly, that, um, we are in a global world now. So, you know, if, if there's a vibe that you're getting from the Nigerian outlets, then there's, you know, you're a video call or an email away from, from anyone in the world. And then I think what I was saying before about digital platform, digital, digital various digital platforms, blogs and social, um, your own site even, they mean that you can bypass some of the outlets. Um, some really successful journalists that I know actually were picked up by bigger publications because they were producing content that was of the same standard um, as they were producing and getting a higher pickup because they were speaking in a voice that their community really recognized. So I think keep going with your content and um, build your community, build your own community, build your space, whether it be a blog or if you can, your own website um, and definitely your social so that you you have something that the, those media outlets actually want rather than you pitching and having to explain who you are and who will be interested. Show them who's interested by building your own audience. But I think it sounds like you're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
I've just been told there's no more questions. But Sorry, guys. <laughs> Um, I've absolutely loved being here. This is the most, one of the most welcoming places I've ever been, and uh, keep being amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank Vanessa Kingori. Thank you.